Hey everyone, welcome to Wildlife Inspired. I'm your host, Scott Keyes, and today we're gonna to discuss macro photography for the wildlife photographer, right after this. Over the past several years, I've gotten a little bit more involved with macro photography, some of that evolving from my interest in native plants and gardenings and increasing the biodiversity around my house has actually opened my eyes to a lot of new insects and flowers and plants. So there's a natural evolution with me as a photographer, and I've done a lot more macro work over the last two years. I do want to put this out, though. I don't consider myself a, a macro expert. So the approach of this video is really as a wildlife photographer who is also interested in macro and some of the things I've learned, discovered, we're going to talk about the gear. So I'm going to show you my camera body. I'm going to show you my actual setup, the lens that I use, as well as the flash uh, diffusers. And we're going to talk about how to get more magnification. So we're going to talk uh, at a very basic level. And the theme of this, again, is as a wildlife photographer. Run and gun. Uh, so as a wildlife photographer, I'm often just out in the field with, with a macro setup. Sometimes I'll do dedicated work, but this is always work that's done outside. So the purpose of this, and there's a, a many different styles, just like there's different genres of wildlife photography, there's kind of different genres of macro photography. We're not going to talk about the, the hyper detailed macro photography. We're not taking specimens indoor for this video. I'm not going to do uh, stacking where we take little slivers of depth of field and combine them into a stacked image. Uh, everything that I'm going to show you here is done out in my yard or out in the wild with, for the most part, single exposures. So not stacked, no extra special software. Again, the approach is as a wildlife photographer, we don't, we want to keep it simple and we want to do possibly things that as we're already out in the field, we've got a macro setup with us. So with that in mind, let's just kind of look through or talk about what is macro photography? What defines macro photography? So very simply, and if you have comments on this or expertise in this, feel free to put it down in the comments if I, if I don't explain this very well, but essentially macro photography means we're projecting our subject at the same size as it would project on our sensor. And they call that magnification ratio or reproduction ratio and you're looking for something that is one to one. And what that means is if your subject, if I have a sensor, uh, I'm gonna estimate the size of the sensor on this crop body is about this big. Maybe it's an inch or two tall. If my sensor is two inches tall, my subject is two inches tall, I'll be able to project that subject to fill from top to bottom of my sensor. So if I've got a subject this big and my sensor is that big, it will replicate exactly to the size of my sense sensor. So I'm. I'm projecting the subject onto my sensor at the same size as it is in real life. Hopefully I explained that well. If I didn't, clarify down in the comments. And how do we do that? Well, macro photographers typically work at very close ranges. And that's one of the difference between a macro lens and say one of the wildlife lenses that we use is typically you can't get close enough to your subjects to get them uh, replicated at a one-to-one -one ratio on your sensor. With a, a standard wildlife lens, normally you're looking at like 0.2, so it would be five times smaller on your sensor than a macro lens. The other thing to distinguish is that when we talk about that one-to-one -one ratio, we're talking about minimum focus distance, so as close as your lens will focus. So we'll deal with that uh, in another part of this video, but I'm going to try to keep it simple and brief and just give you some tips um, for wildlife photographers who might be interested in trying this out or who are trying it out and looking at maybe some ways to improve. So here we go. First thing I'm gonna discuss is my camera body. Now I use my D500 as a dedicated body for macro photography. I will show you the lens I use. This is an older lens, nothing super fancy and nothing crazy expensive. It's a third party lens. This particular lens is made by Tokina. I've recommended it to other people. This is their 100 millimeter 2.8. They've got a couple versions. This is an older version. They've got a newer version. I'll put links down to it at the bottom. Uh, the benefit for me with this lens is one, it's got actually really good quality. It's comparable or very close to the Nikon macro lenses that I've uh, used in the past. It's about half the price and the used market is even less. So you can pick these up used. I'm going to guess around two to $300 a brand new macro lens by Canon or Nikon is probably going to run you between $800 and $1,200. So for me, not a dedicated macro photographer, I want to be cost effective. I'm going to use my older body, my crop sensor body, and I'm going to use a dedicated macro lens. It does give me that one-to-one -one ratio. 
Why do I use a crop sensor? Well, one, I have it and it's available. Two, if I'm getting as close as I can, a lot of times the point is to get the subjects really large in frame. And if you're using a full frame body, you may end up cropping down anyway. So for me, there's not a huge penalty to using a crop sensor. One of the reasons people use full frame bodies, and it's one of the reasons, not the only reason, is oftentimes they perform better in low light. Now that, again, that is not a, a blanket statement that has a lot to do with pixel density and the, the quality of the sensor. But one of the reasons people use full frame is that they perform better with high noise or high ISO. With my photography and macro, I've evolved more into flash photography and I don't really worry about noise as much. I'm often shooting at base ISO, so like 100, 200, 300, 400. I'm not shooting at extremely high ISO. So there's really no penalty from a noise standpoint to using a crop body and they are less expensive overall, generally. So I've got a, a less expensive lens here and a less expensive body. Uh, and I would be very comfortable because I don't need high frame rate with macro. If you've got an old body that you wanna dedicate to this, as long as the sensor is a good quality. So if you're a Nikon shooter and you've got all the way back to the D7000 series, which had a really nice sensor, I would be very comfortable shooting macro on a D7000. And you now you're talking about much less, especially on the on the used market. I don't know what the going rate is for a D7000 or a D7100, but I'm guessing, you know, 500 bucks maybe you could get that body and then you could get a macro lens used. Maybe you're looking at $700 for a dedicated macro setup. Of course, you can use whatever body you're using, but I will show you the benefits of having a dedicated body, especially if you're a wildlife photographer. Um, I really love having just a second body set up all the time to do it. So that's my setup. I'm using the D500 crop sensor, but again, any good quality sen uh, sensor over the last five or six years is probably going to be more than competent to do this. And I'm just using a value oriented lens. Uh, for me, it's the Tokina uh, 100 millimeter 2.8. By the way, that 100 millimeters is a pretty standard size for macro, but they do make macro lenses all the way down. I think they've got one down at 15 millimeters. They go up to about 150 millimeters is typical. 100 is a very, very standard size. So 100, 105 in that range is a 90 millimeters, very standard for macro photography. It allows you a good working distance um, for subjects that you, that you can get close to. And in another video, I'm actually gonna deal with how to use other lenses when you might need a little bit more working room. But for this one, we're gonna talk about just these, uh, these macro lenses. So that's my body, that's my lens. Let's talk about other equipment that I use currently and how I got to that. So here I'm holding a flash and a diffuser. Now this is for me, uh, this is the Nikon SB700. I, I find it to be a very good flash. They go up in price. You can get third party flashes for much less. Typically, you're going to spend between about $100 and $400 for a good quality flash, depending on the vendor and the manufacturer and the model number. It doesn't have to be super. Um, you're going to be at pretty close range, so you don't need the highest power one that you find. But I would say shop around. I'm going to put a couple of recommendations down in the, in the comments on flashes that I've had other people use that they recommended third-party flashes, but I've always only used Nikon flashes. This is a standard flash. This gets mounted onto the shoe the hot shoe, so, and I'll do this in a second, but I'm gonna put this right on here. Now, there are other flashes that they make. I actually own one and I've used this in the past. This is a ring flash and it comes with a little commander here. So this is what goes on the hot shoe. This actually goes around the lens and it allows you to get these lights really, really close, these flashes really, really close to the subject. And so I've used this in the past. It came off a little bit hard. I wasn't able to diffuse this quite as much as I liked. So again, I'm using just a standard flash but the diffuser is really what's important to me. I'm actually gonna show you right now an image taken without the diffuser and taken with the diffuser. And I'll put them side by side here on the screen a little bit closer and let you look at that. And you can see how, how much this diffuser makes a difference. And for me, it made a, a really big difference. And when I started to use it, I was really, really happy with it. Now, diffusers, you can make them yourself. There's lots of videos on YouTube, um, DIY diffusers, this one I bought just out of convenience. It's from a company, um, it's AK Diffuser. You can see the logo there. I'll put a link down to them at the bottom. I don't have a strong affiliation with them. I don't get anything for that you purchasing from them, but 
they were kind enough to give me this a few years ago and I've been very happy with it. I've never used another diffuser. I don't know if it's the best one made, but I know that people that I've talked to um, speak very highly of this as well. So I'll recommend AK Diffuser, but again, I have very limited experience with this and there's no affiliation with me in this company other than they gave this to me a few years ago for a social media promotion. And as you can see from that comparison, these diffusers really just work to soften, soften the light. It's the same as like a soft box would be for a portrait photographer. And very, very important. Another thing that this diffuser does is it actually puts shade often over the subject. So if your subject is here on my hand, I can actually put this on top to shade out the subject so only the flash is hitting it. And that can give you some really interesting looks. In fact, I'm gonna show you a couple right here. So I brought up the, um, and this is my Flickr account, by the way. I create albums on my Flickr page and it's under S keys images. This allows actually you to go in and, and view these images. I upload everything at a lower resolution. So these are all uploaded at 1500 pixels. So when you're looking at, if you've got a 4K monitor that you may say, wow, these images are low resolution. They're actually downsized. Most of these are between 3000 and 6,000 pixels on the long side, and they're just downsized for social media. So let's look at some of these images now and just show you how that flash and diffuser system works. And you, one, one thing you're going to notice is all of these have a dark black background. I'll show you some other ones later. Here's some of my flower photography, uh, some of my native plants around the yard. Here's a robber fly. It's called rich weed. This is a milkweed tussock moth. And I'm using the flash now shaded over the subject and in a shaded area where that background isn't getting any of the flash. So this is where this blacked out look comes from. You don't have to do this. It's something I've played around with more and more. I like it. I like this look. But again, this is strictly personal preference, whether you like this or not. Now, I don't always use a flash. So in this image here, you, this is not with a flash. This is a small caddy did on swamp milkweed right in my backyard. Uh, and this one was just with overcast natural light. So again, with this overcast light, you can get some nice looks as well. It's much tougher to get that blacked out image. Uh, when you use the flash, you tend to get that blacked out image. When I first started doing macro work, I approached it the same way I would with my bird photography. I was using all natural light. I don't use flash for birds at all. And I had a mindset that natural light is the best available light. It looks the best when it's done right. And so I wanted to, to use that in my macro work. The problem was I learned very quickly that at aperture f4 or 2.8 or even 5.6, the depth of field when you're working so close is so shallow, it's very, very tough to get the subject in frame. Also, because you're working very close, any movement of the subject, whether the wind is blowing outside, any movement tends to create motion. And you're so close that that little motion is exaggerated. So you have to use higher shutter speeds. And what I found is my ISO was going all the way up through the roof. I mean, I was having to shoot at, you know, 12,000 or, or 12,800. It, it was just a lot of noise. In the perfect light, I was able to do it. Where it was still soft and a lot of available light. But what I found with the flash is it allowed me to stop down to about F12, F16 didn't have to worry about noise anymore. I'm letting the flash control all that. And when you do flash photography, I do it very simply through what's called TTL through the lens. I would recommend, especially as a wildlife photographer, you don't wanna be out there in the field playing around with flashes. If you're not familiar with them, it's a lot of work to manually figure out how to dial in all your settings. TTL allows the flash basically to meter through your camera and determine how strong of the flash is. So as you adjust in camera, as I turn the ISO down to 100, the flash simply compensates and becomes stronger. So TTL for me is really, really big deal. I use it almost exclusively. I don't play around with that. Again, I'm not a macro photographer. This video is not for how to be the greatest macro photographer. It's how to functionally get really good or, or to improve at least in macro photography as a wildlife shooter. And the concept is keep it value oriented for me. Keep it simple. Again, TTL, I'm not going into manual flash exposure and adjusting everything, and I'm not doing stacking. I'm trying to keep it simple and still create images that I like a lot. Let's go through a couple more of these images, and you can see um, this, again, is natural light taken with that same Tokina lens in a much softer look. So uh, I think I, instead of stopping down, I think I actually, and I'll go back because I have the settings at the bottom here. 
uh, at, yeah, this was at f4.2 with just natural light. Really, really pretty. And then you can also use a combination of flash and natural light. So here I am using flash to kind of fill the front of the subject while getting the golden sunset in the background. So this was a combination, kind of a hybrid between flash and natural light together. And all of the flash images don't have to be, when you fool around with it and you dial it in right, you can get colors in the background, like this bee on coneflower. Here's a little hoverfly on flocks. Here's some more. So notice I'm using the color in the background and I'm playing around with the flash settings. I'm not going to go into specifics on flash settings because it's a whole nother video for that. I will tell you on my Patreon channel, I've covered some of this, how to get different backgrounds using flash photography because I have a lot of macro friends who are wildlife photographers um, that were interested in that. So I did some videos over on Patreon. You can check that out down in the comments. I'll put a link down there. Some milkweed. And then you can see just how close you're able to work. You know, you're really able to get close and to get some details. Again, I'm not getting the hyper details. There are some macro photographers who, who are amazing, who get these incredibly detailed images. I mean, where it's just, just the eye or just the mouth or just the head, and you've got all of this detail, but they're doing that in a, normally in a very controlled environment, often indoors, where there's no wind and there's no disruptions. They can control the light, they get everything dialed in. And then they're using little sliding rails to take multiple frames, sometimes dozens or even hundreds of frames, and then using software to stack those together. It's not what my photography is about for macro. Again, this is geared at the wildlife photographer, um, maybe getting an introduction to macro or trying to improve a little bit. And a lot of this is just about how to, how to compose. You know, once you become a, a better at photography in general, some of the same elements you would use in bird photography or any other photography come into play with, with macro. And I'm I try to be very conscientious over the last couple of years about improving on things like composition and light and perspective and engagement. Some of the same principles that I use for birds, you know, those eye level looks. Here's a good example of that, uh, getting an eye level look with hoverflies. Little button bush is the flower. Uh, that's a clouded bug. And, you know, a nice focus on composition here, something I really like this image, very pleasing to me overall, not hyper detailed, single exposure and um, using flash. And I'll just breeze through a couple more of these images. I've got some flower stuff in here as well, just so you can get an idea of the work that I've done over the last couple years. Some of it a focus on detail, some of it a focus on color, some of it a focus on pattern or symmetry, like this image, a focus on symmetry. And again, here with a focus on symmetry. Let's get back to, to just the last couple things. And I'm going to take this flash off. We've talked about the body. Uh, again, crop sensor for me is fine. We've talked about the lens, trying to get a one-to-one -one, uh, reproduction ratio with your lens. Finding a good value for me was important. And I think this Tokina uh, fit, the, fit the bill. It gave me what I was looking for in terms of price and value. And then the last thing I want to talk about is, are there other accessories that you might want as a wildlife photographer. There's a couple I'm gonna recommend. Now, one thing you're gonna hear with, um, with macro photography are extension tubes. And this is an example of an extension tube. Now, this is for my Z-mount lens. So uh, I'm not gonna, I can't put this on my, my crop body, but I've got extension tubes for both my crop and my Z-mount. Uh, just playing around with these, by the way. I've got another video coming up after this where I'm gonna show you this extension tube on my 70 to 200 and how I, how, how I do some macro-like work, but not true macro work. And then this is another one, and this is generally referred to as a diopter. You may, you may hear it called a magnifier. This is simply a piece of glass. This is, is essentially a magnifying glass, and it threads right on here. Now, these two items uh, are accessories that most macro photographers own in their kit, one or the other, sometimes not both. What they allow is both of these serve the same function. This has no glass, so you can see I put my finger through it. This just changes the focusing distance. It allows you to get closer to your subject. Note that with both of these, as these both do the same thing, they allow you to get closer to the subject. They also limit how far away you can get. So you get closer, but you also get narrower. So the distance that you can shoot from actually becomes more confined. You can't back up 30 or 40 feet away anymore. You've got to stay kind of in this sweet spot but it will allow you to get maybe an inch or two closer to your subject. I'm gonna take a picture. I'm gonna show you what that looks like in just a second. So if they both do the same thing, which one should I get? Well, honestly, 
This will probably give you a cleaner image because there's no glass. You're not shooting through anything. The diopter, if you were pixel peeping, it may not give you as clean of an image because you're shooting through another layer of glass, which can also get dirty or dusty or fingerprints or whatever. Um, but I use a diopter and I'm going to show you why. Out in the field, uh, this threads on. And so if I'm out in my yard and or out in the wild and I'm shooting and I've got the diopter on normally all the time so I can get closer and then I want to back up, let's say I can only get six or seven feet away, but I, I want a shot. Well, this is just a lot easier for me to unthread and put in my pocket or, or a little holder, a little sleeve that I carry. And now I'm back to the original 100 millimeter where I can back up to infinity. I can shoot just, I could shoot portraits with this if I wanted to. It wouldn't be the greatest portrait lens in the world, but I can back up and take pictures with it. If I've got an extension tube on, which is going to go between the body and the lens, it's a little more cumbersome. I've got to stop, pop it off, pop it off the body, pop it off the lens, and then put that back together. And then if I want to put it back on. So honestly, the reason I use a diopter is just for convenience. Again, if, you, if I was doing just quality, if I was indoors, controlled environment, um, dedicated setup, I, I might use an extension tube in, uh, in, instead of the diopter. Uh, I am going to just show you real quickly. So I'm going to focus with the lens on the lip of this cup, and I'm going to get as close as I can without a diopter or extension tubes on. And this will give you an idea of what your working distance is from here. So I'm able to get right in here, right to about there. Okay. So that would be the distance. So hopefully you got a good visual of that. Now I'm going to take that little diopter and put it on here. And again, the advantage for me is I can just thread it on and thread it off really quickly. So it's already on. And let's see how close I can get now. Okay, I'm going to back up just a bit right there. So there you can see the difference in it, not much couple inches. And now to show you what that would look like, I showed you the distance to that coffee cup. Now I'm going to actually zoom in to this little Bic highlighter that I have that I keep in the office. And I'm going to try to get as close as I can without the diopter on first. And I'm going to take a picture and I'm going to put it up on the screen and I'm going to put it side by side with the other one. So here we go. I'm going to zoom in on that little guy right there. Okay. That's number one with a field of it, there's the depth of field is so shallow. You could see me just trying to, I'm not using autofocus, by the way, I'm on manual focus and I'm going to come in here, do the same thing. And I'm just be a lot easier with a tripod to control this, but I'm going to put these images up on the screen so you can see the difference. I would estimate the diopter or extension tubes, the different extension tubes, by the way, come in different lengths. So they'll get you a little closer depending on the length. This particular setup probably gives me about 20% greater. Diopters also come in strength, so you can get some that magnify more or get you a little bit closer. So that's that's extension tubes and diopters. I use one, I keep it on. I use the threaded one so I can take it off, put it in my pocket, put it back on when I need it. And, um, and that's my setup. So we talked about body. We talked about lens. We talked about accessories, the diopter specifically or extension tubes showed you the flash and the diffuser that I use, and I showed you a couple images. The last thing I want to talk about is practicality. When I'm doing uh, macro photography as a wildlife photographer, often it's a second setup. That's why I love this dedicated setup where I can just take my old, kind of my old body and older lens, put it together, and then I just need to carry it. So how do I carry it? Well, I did a video on carrying systems. And the one that I use, you'll see actually the plate on the bottom here. So I use one by Spider System, Spider Holster. And I, just, I really like it. It's so well built. Wedding photographers use these a lot. I know some wildlife photographers that use this for their second setup as well. It's a little, I, not something I would want to carry a heavy lens on. It's just too much weight and it goes around your waist. I did a video on these carrying systems, so I'll reference that in a card up here. Other, other companies, Peak Design makes a carrying system. Cotton Carrier makes a carrying system. I'll put links to all of them down there. So if you're curious, you can check this out. But this is what I use. I keep that macro lens on my hip, even when I'm hiking out in the field, where it becomes more of a challenge. And I'll be very honest with you, the diffuser, when I'm doing a long hike out in the field, that can be a challenge. So often if I'm hiking and just doing like 
oh, I wanna have the macro lens in case I see something cool. Sometimes I will take that diffuser off because it just gets to be pretty cumbersome um, and it can get in the way. There are, again, many diffusers. Some of them have a lower profile. They might be easier to transport. Some of them can pop on and off real quickly. So I'm gonna leave that up to you to investigate. When I'm around my house, I always use the diffuser though, of the flash and the diffuser. Oh, I should say almost always use the flash and the diffuser. When I'm out in the woods, it depends on how far that hike is. If it's short, I may keep the system together. If it's a long hike, sometimes I'll take that apart and just have it as, as something there in case I see something cool. I know as a bird photographer, I take it very seriously. I put a ton of time into it. And when somebody who isn't a bird photographer makes a video, a how-to video, I, I feel like maybe they're out of their league. I hope I wasn't out of my league with this one. I hope you understand the, the intent of this video was really just to show you as a wildlife photographer what you can do with macro. I'm gonna do a follow-up. In the follow-up, I'm actually gonna avoid the macro lens. And we're gonna to try to show you some ways to do macro-like photography maybe with the existing wildlife equipment that you have. So stay tuned for that video out in the future. Feel free to leave comments down below. This is the first time I've done anything kind of outside of bird photography. So if you have questions, you leave them down in the comments. I'll try to answer them for you. If I've got some macro experts out there, feel free to correct me. I don't get offended by that. I'm a bird photographer first, but I do think that there could be some value in here for people that are looking to explore a little bit more macro and maybe just want some tips or suggestions uh, or maybe just see how I do it because maybe you've seen some of the images that I have on social media and you enjoyed them as well. So as always, thanks for your support on the channel. If you haven't subscribed, go down there, hit that subscribe button, leave me that comment. And as always, I hope we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together.